Hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about fuels and chemicals. What comes to your mind when I mention the words fuels and chemicals? And for me, I think about the gasolines that I use for my car to drive to work every day. I think about the gas that we use to keep our home warm in the winter. I think about the clothes that I'm wearing right now, and also about the plastic that I can see wherever I go. I also think about the fertilizer that we use to increase the production of the crops so that we have enough food for everyone. Now you see, fuels and chemicals are amazing. They provide us with energy, clothes, food every single day. So what's the problem with them? Well, actually, there's no problem. Now, the problem is the way we are making them. Currently, we use fossil feedstock to make fuels and chemicals. And when we burn these fuels, we emit carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And because more than 80% of our energy that we are using now comes from the fossil feedstock, so we end up emitting too much carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, leading to a rapid increase in CO2 concentration. And that is the cause of global warming and many other negative effects. Now, the question for us is, how can we keep using this amazing material but without producing carbon dioxide? My high school chemistry reminds me that it's not easy to burn carbon fuels without making uh, carbon dioxide, but there are ways to go around it. Imagine if we can make fuels and chemicals from carbon dioxide and water instead of using the fossil feedstock. Now, if we can do that, then when we burn the fuels, we do not emit new carbon dioxide because these fuels are made from the carbon dioxide in the first place. Well, from a chemical point of view, this is doable, right? Because fuels and chemicals are mainly made from carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. And we can have all of these ingredients from carbon dioxide and water. But from a energy point of view, there's something missing here. We are burning fuels to get energy and emit carbon dioxide. If we want to convert carbon dioxide back to fuels, we need energy. And not any kind of energy. We need clean energy like wind, solar, nuclear, if we want to make clean fuels. And today, I want to introduce a technology that can do just that taking carbon dioxide, water, and renewable energy to make fuels and chemicals. That is electrochemical conversion process. Now a process that use electricity to drive a chemical reaction. Now in this process, we can use carbon dioxide and water at the feedstock. And we use elect electrical power to break down this molecule into carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen atoms. And then we can combine them to produce the product that we want. Now, for example, we can produce methanol or ethanol to be used as fuels. We can make ethanol as a precursor for plastic production. We can even make urea or fertilizer if we know how to combine carbon dioxide and nitrogen. And this sounds amazing, right? A two electrode, one membrane doing magical things. It looks very simple, but actually it's not. And let me show you why. When you feed a carbon dioxide into a reactor, it will go through multiple states from a gas molecule into a gas molecule trapped in a solution, and then it is stabilized on the surface of a solid called catalyst. 
And here, the CO2 molecule is transformed into many different intermediates before forming the final products, like ethylene in this case, for example. And every single step can influence the process and your final product. And every single step can cause some energy. So in order to make the product that you want, and in order to improve the efficiency of the process, you need to get everything right. Now, first, you need a right surface of the catalyst, because this is the most important part. It is where the CO2 is transformed into the product that you want. But you also need right environment, like right ions, right solvent. You need right amount of carbon dioxide, right amount of electricity. Now, a lot of things need to be right. But despite these challenges, now over the past few decades, we made good progress on this technology. Now, we know how to choose the right catalyst for the product that we want to produce. Even though we do not have a lot of options, if we look at the periodic table. If we want to make like carbon monoxide, then gold, silver, and zinc are great options. If we want to make formic acid, then we can use bitmuth or tin or indium. And if we want to make hydrocarbons, angerhol, then copper is the best and currently the only option we have. We also know how to tune the structure of the catalyst to improve the selectivity. And let's take copper as one example. If we have a flat surface of the copper, then we're gonna convert carbon dioxide to methane. If we make a catalyst with a round surface, then we produce a good catalyst for ethylene production because we know that when we change the texture of the catalyst surface, we do not really change only the active side, but we also change the local environment. Now, another example is about the nanoparticle or the size of the, of the catalyst. Uh, for example, nickel, iron, and cobalt nanoparticle are not good catalyst for CO2 conversion. They can only make hydrogen. But when you bring down the size of the particle to the atomic scale, and then you embed these atoms into a carbon metric, producing single atom catalyst. Now you have a very good catalyst for CO2 reduction to carbon monoxide. And this is very interesting because I mentioned that we do not have a lot of option if we use the metallic catalyst, but now when we bring down the size of the metallic particle, we can produce many good catalysts for CO2 uh, conversion. And we're also able to transform from this fundamental understanding into a practical advance. And in this graph, I show the progress that our group and together with many other group in the fields uh, in the production of ethanine and ethanol. So the blue bubble is for ethanine and the red bubble is for ethanol and the size of the bubble reflecting the selectivity of the process. And as you can see here, over the, over the past five or six years, we made good progress in terms of production rate for ethylene. We can also improve uh, the selectivity of the process. And similar for ethanol, we increase both the production rate and the selectivity. Now, even though compared to ethylene, the progress and the performance metric for ethanol production is still a little bit behind. We also know how to make a stable system for CO2 conversion. If you ask me about five years ago, so the best system for CO2 conversion to ethylene can last only 10 or 20 hours. But in 
2018, we report the first electrode configuration that can convert carbon dioxide to ethylene with very high selectivity and high stability. And this electrode configuration can maintain high ethylene selectivity for more than 100 hours. And seeing then many other work on CO2 conversion to ethylene with high selectivity and high stability have been demonstrated. Even though we made good progress so far, we are still not there yet. But it also de depend on the product that we want to produce. For example, nitrile carbon monoxide and, and fog mage, which are quite simple products, uh, the current performance metric is very close to the target that we want. So we are quite close to the large scale production. But for more complex product like ethylene and ethanol, uh, we are still behind our target. Now we are doing okay in terms of product selectivity and the reaction rate very close to the target. But in terms of energy efficiency, now the current performance is still far below our target, meaning that we still need a lot of electricity to produce ethylene. And in terms of stability, uh, we are still far behind the target a few tens of thousands of hours. Our best system so far can run for only a few hundred hours. Now, the question for us now is, how can we close the gap? How can we achieve our target so that we can demonstrate this technology at a large scale? And in order to do that, we need better catalysts, better electrochemical system so that we can improve both the energy efficiency and improve the stability of the system. And to achieve that, we will need tools and resources now, for example, we will need fabrication tool that allows us to make the catalyst with precise structure at the atomic scale. We also need like, a lot of testing system, especially high throughput and accelerator testing for screening various types of catalysts and also to accelerate the stability testing. We need characterization especially operando characterization that allows us to understand the reaction mechanism and also to uh, understand the changes of catalysts and other components in a electrochemical cell so that we can design better catalyst and system um, for this application. And finally, we also need support from uh, modeling, simulation, or machine learning, because this uh, will allow us to understand the process at the atomic scale, but also allows us to understand how we're going to integrate this technology in the current um, infrastructure at the very large scale. Okay? And machine learning can also help us to predict some uh, material uh, that can be used for CO2 conversion. Now, if we can bring all of these things together, then I believe renewable fuels and chemicals from carbon dioxide and water is not so far away. Now imagine a world in which everyone from everywhere, especially poor people, can have access to clean energy, water, and food all made from carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight. What could be a better world? Thank you.